Get a six. So if Stuart gets a six, what will that say about him? He's heading for a good job and a good life, and it shows he's not going to be living on the streets and stuff like that. And if you get a level two, what will that, what will that say about you? Um, I might not have a good life in front of me. I might grow up and do something naughty or something like that. So here you see that this, this student is being, is generalizing into this whole moral field now. That the teacher is, is saying that, you know, people with low sex levels will become criminals. And this student doesn't have the agency to be able to reject that. And therefore is, 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 is expanding this, this notion of what it means to be at a level two as opposed to level six into a whole realm that nobody with any kind of rational perspective could, could believe. But the point is, this is, this is the figured world that this student is experiencing. I'm really scared about the sets. Ms. O'Brien, the teacher at the school, came and talked to us about our spelling. I'm a good at spelling, and David, the class teacher, is giving us times tables tests every morning. And I'm putting some times tables on Friday, I'll do the sets, and I'll be in nothing. If you remember, um, the SATs have this, the sets have this, this the property that if you fail to achieve enough points to get the lowest level in the tier for which you're entered, I don't know if it's still the case, but at this time, you didn't get any level at all. You didn't get an award. And I don't, I don't, we don't know what the teacher actually said to the students, but this student's notion internalizes this as I'll be a nothing. I don't understand how you can't be a nothing. Yes, you can, because you have to get a level like a level four or a level five. And if you're no good at spellings and times tables, you don't get those levels, and so you're a nothing. I'm sure that's not right. Yes, it is, because that's what was a rhyme said. So for this student, again, this, this figured world that's been created for her is one in which she, you know, I mean, we, we spent time talking about what this child means by I'll be nothing. But clearly is the structure is so strong in this particular school that this student was unable to resist being described in these practices as a nothing. Uh, looking at the ability group. Also, people find maths very hard. There's always a psychological thing in your mind that maths is hard. No matter what. Everyone thinks maths is hard. So when you're trying to concentrate, they're thinking, no, maths is hard. I don't want to do it. So where do you think that comes from? I don't know. People are around. People, you don't see mathematicians being a normal person. They have to be really big and brainy. <laughs> and this, this invokes this notion of desire I mentioned earlier. What this student, I think, is single with is that the figured world that has been presented to her about what it means to be a mathematician is not one that she wants to enter. So she's making almost a conscious decision that she does not want to develop an identity that has that component in it. And so she's also making a, a conscious choice not to enter into that world. Tanya, on the other hand, is able to exercise more agency in this respect. There were a couple of lessons where it really sort of hit me as like I was really working hard and I really changed my attitude in maths. I found the people I thought were so clever, I was getting better marks than them. And I was more ahead of them in the class. While they were just like chatting, so I, I thought, you know, I think there were some people, like people in my class, the ones people feel threatened by, those kinds of people. I find that they'll just stick to it like this is it. This is how you have to do it, and you always have to do it like this. Whereas me, I can't do it like that. That's why I bring an old work, because I won't be able to answer the question like how they do it. So I'll try and bring everything I know to try and find an answer. So what is it you think they do? It's like, imagine we're doing an equation or something, we're trying to find a solution to it. They'll say, here's the formula, this is what you do. Where I would probably go, if I look back at this topic, I can use that to solve this bit, and I'll do that, and I'll get answer like that. So what Tanya was able to do was, in another set, she was able to develop an identity for herself as a mathematician, which did not require her adopting the norms of the rest of the class. So she found a different way to be a mathematician, unlike the, pre the prescribed identities that had been laid out for what it was to be a mathematician. Um, and these are American students looking at their option choices in, in American high schools. Uh, there's definitely a certain type of person who's better at math. Generally, if better at English, they seem to be more social. And the math people, I don't know, they're just as social, but in a different way. They express themselves differently. They like to see things in black and white. They don't see the colors and grays in between. With English people, they like things that don't necessarily have an answer. They like to explore that. Why wouldn't you major in math? I think I'm a more creative person. I can do it and I can understand it, but it's not something I could do for the rest of my life. And I think I've had a job, I'd like one that let me be a bit more creative. Math isn't creative? No. 
I think women, being that they're more emotional and more emotionally involved, and life is more like concrete. It's, it's so, it's that and that's it. Women are more, they want to explore stuff. And that's life, kind of. Like, that. I think that's why I like English and science. I'm more interested in like phenomena and nature and animals. I'm just not interested in just, you give me a formula, I'm supposed to memorize the answer, apply it, and that's it. So again, the figured world that was presented to these students about the world of mathematics, was what they decided to do. <coughs> do you like that? No, I hate it. Why do you hate it? It's just too... I'm into the history of English. It's like too logical for me. It always has to be one answer. You can't get anything but, but that answer. I used to love math, but now I think it's like I'm going to make sure that I don't major in math or anything because it's starting to be like too much competition. It's so weird. When it came to calculus and pre-calculus, I just kind of lost interest. It's like I'm going to do this with the points. I don't really care. I care more about science and English. It stuff makes sense to me, where I think I'm learning morals and lessons from this, where I can apply to something. So again, these students are coming with the same sort of attitudes. Now, one can problematize this by thinking about, I mean, I, I can't see these students' attitudes as maladaptive. I mean, they're making a conscious decision not to enter a world, which I think is a pretty horrible world to want to enter. I mean, if I think we were serious about this, we'd be starting to ask questions about why it is that anybody who wants to enter a world that is, that is so dehumanized <coughs> and so abstracted from anything we might care about as the kind of world of mathematics that they have been offered. Uh, I have to say that in America, I, I, I hadn't understood it until I saw it, how incredibly proceduralized and deconceptualized American math education is. I mean, it, I mean, it really is so destroying the boring. So, uh, as I said, I'm I think... I'm getting to some over here. Yeah, <laughs> it's got worse, isn't it? But I, 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 I'll, I'll show you these slides and so you can actually get the references that I've drawn from. But I think the point I'm trying to make is that with, with the sociocultural perspective, we can think about how students exercise this individual agency within a set of constraints. And the important thing that I take from the particular uh, Dorothy Holmes work about figured worlds is that it's about the world that people experience. It doesn't matter what you think the world is about. It's the world that, that they are presented with and it's the world that they figure. And people make negotiations. So the, the desire um, triggers either a, an engagement or a disengagement. In, in the Dorothy Holland book, there's a very nice um, chapter called The Woman Who Climbed Up the House. And it's about an Nepalese woman who is a cleaner in a, in a high caste household. And she's not allowed to cross the half of the household, otherwise it's allowed a cleansing which was and she's actually locked herself out, and she needs to get back into the bedroom to retrieve something. And so what she actually does is she climbs up the outside of the house to get into the bedroom without going across the hearth. So then they present this as an example of somebody solving a problem within a figured world. But the point is she's a she's an identifying agency. So she's actually exercising agency within this figured world. And I think this notion of desire, another thing, she, she could also have adopted a approach that says, I can't do anything. And that would actually be a, a, a relatively lesser amount of agency, or no agency. Uh, but I, I do think that the, this notion of structure and agency, this notion of people becoming attuned to constraints and affordances that exist within the figured world of community practice, and this issue about whether people feel that they, are, that they want to be a part of this figured world, this desire for belonging or not, uh, has a very, very substantial explanatory power in looking at the problems that we experience when, when students choose not to 